Good morning, or good afternoon. How are we doing today? I am tired too. <laughs> I can imagine. How did the midterm go? How do you feel about it? Um, it was challenging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really makes you think about how necessary it is to know your cases. Um, but in general, good practice, I would assume. <laughs> What do you mean by what do you mean by it makes you think about how necessary it is to know your cases? Well, with um, Dr. Matthews midterm, she usually creates scenarios based on cases that we've done on our worksheets. Mm -hmm. So, in order for you to actually understand what the question is asking of you with respect to a particular topic, you have to have an idea of the case or else you'll be fumbling like, oh, what is this? What, what element should I be looking at? That kind of thing. Okay, that makes sense. And certainly, you know, uh, as I've said all semester, right? Um, you know, some of my colleagues take a very case-oriented approach to the material. I do not. Um, and so, you know, for those courses, certainly you absolutely need to be focused on making sure that you know the cases well enough to be able to identify what authorities are being drawn on. Um, but that's not how this class, how this course runs. Um, so here is my one and only piece of advice about post-exam management, okay? If someone comes up to you and starts asking, oh, what'd you put for number four? What'd you put for number 10? What'd you put for number 16? Just slap them. Just slap them. Do not answer that question. Here is why. Comparison is the thief of joy. And what this person is asking you to do is compare yourselves to them. Because whatever you say, the response you are going to get is, oh, well, I put something else. And one of you is going to walk away from that conversation feeling like a pile of crap. And so uh, possible that both of you do, right? Possible, possible you, each of you convinces the other that they were wrong. Um, so just don't do it. Don't start those conversations. And if someone else tries to start it with you, don't, don't take the bait. Just, just keep walking, right? Um, so that is my one and only advice, piece of advice on how to cope with post-exam anxiety is that the people who want to cope with their post-exam anxiety by comparing their answers to yours, those people are poison and you need to have nothing to do with them until they get their own mess figured out. Um, so with that, and I see Cammie's like, I learned this from form one and I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, I had to be told by my contracts professor, don't do it, do not do it, okay? Um, all right, so how do you guys feel about the discussion we had about occupier's liability. Does this feel like you guys have a grip on this? What's still confusing?
everything's clear. Nothing, nothing is confusing. It's okay to be thinking for a second or two or even longer. Is it yeah. possible for you to go over the four categories of the four categories that we discuss um, in class? So you sure. Class five, the invitee, and those things. Sure. Um, I'm not going to just re-deliver the lecture. Uh, the recordings will be posted um, relatively soon, um, but here is sort of the thirty thousand foot overview, right? Um, trespassers are owed no duty except the duty of common humanity, which I have been describing as the duty not to watch somebody bleed out and die on your property. Um, the, uh, the next level of category is the licensee, which is someone who has permission to come onto your property, but doesn't really have like a business purpose. And so it's things like, um, you know, your dinner guests or your, uh, um, you know, your friends and family, right? Those are people who are licensees and they are owed a fairly minimal duty, right? Basically, if you know that there's a danger on the property, you should warn them about it. So tell them about your bear traps, not that you are entitled to put down bear traps, don't put down bear traps. Um, the next class is the invitee. And so these are people who don't have a contract with you, but are coming onto your property in order to conduct business. Okay, so that might be the police officer or the firefighter or the postman or um, the, you know, if you run a, a store, the customers of the store, who come into the, the property to, you know, determine whether they want to buy anything from you. Those people are owed a duty to, for you to keep the place reasonably free of unusual harms, right? And so this is where a lot of slip and fall cases come from, where you, uh, the, the store owner is alleged that they knew about a spill, right? Clean up on aisle four, um, and they didn't. They didn't clean it up, and the uh, the plaintiff uh, fell and injured themselves. And then the contractual invitee are people who have an actual contract to enter onto your property. So tradesmen um, and you know, hotel guests, right? That sort of thing. Um, those people are owed a warranty of a safe premises. And either, and, and there's two different categories, but basically uh, if you remember that it's a warranty rather than a duty of care, that'll be the, that's the first step in the right direction. The difference in the two categories is going to be relatively minor, okay? So what does this does this help? Do you feel like this gives you a better a better grip? Uh, I think it was Nikita who asked this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. What other questions do you guys have about occupiers' liability? Sir, on the topic of um, ch child press child trespassers, mm -hmm. I was wondering if the child tras trespasser is all the same duty of care as the child visitor? Um, the answer to that is no. Uh, the child visitor is, hmm.
I mean, that's an interesting question because certainly, right, we do things um, related to the child trespasser that we don't do. Like there's a heightened duty of care that's higher even than what we owe to an adult invitee, right? Adult invitees are not entitled to uh, to make claims if the, you know, if there are dangers that, sh that they say if they were walled off, they wouldn't have been dangerous. Um, whereas a child trespasser is absolutely entitled to have the occupier take steps to separate the child from um, known dangers. Uh, I think the key piece of this, right, lies in the conditions precedent to the duty of care for the child trespasser, okay? Specifically, it requires that the occupier have a reasonable expectation that children will wander onto the property, right? Either because there's an allurement, and so you sort of look out at your property and you go, yep, that's a thing that's gonna attract children, or you look out on your property and you see children on it, and so you actually know that they're there. Um, so I think that, you know, that is sort of the key piece of this is that um, it's reasonable to expect unaccompanied children to come onto the property. And so then they are, you know, there's a duty to protect them from themselves. With the child visitor, um, most of the time, those folks, you know, those children are going to be accompanied by adults. And you even as the occupier have the right to say that children are not welcome on the property unless they're accompanied by adults, in which case, you don't owe any additional duty to them. So I think, um, I actually think in some circumstances, the duty to the child trespasser may be higher than the duty to the child visitor um, because of the ability of the occupier to exercise control over who visits, right? And to say, you know, no, we don't want these types of visitors. Does that make sense? Does that sound? It yeah, feels, I get it. It feels I, like this sounds insane to me, but I, I, you know, let me let me check in and make sure that you guys, uh, are 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 with me. Uh, I agree. So, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go Claudia. Ahead. Sorry. Right, I agree with the insanity, but it does sound crazy that a trespasser would be afforded a greater level of duty of care. But I, it does also make sense. Yeah. So, and, and it's, it's specifically because of the child's lack of capacity to appreciate their own danger. And it's, you know, this is, you remember, you remember we harped on and, and you guys, you know, um, there were a number of people who were confused about like what constitutes a policy consideration. This is a policy consideration, right? This is a decision by the courts to impose a duty of care where no one else would, Im where, where it's not imposed in any other circumstances for this specific narrow slice of, of circumstance, right? Um, I think that's, that's a really helpful um, way for us to think about, about this, um, is that this is a, a court that is, this is a the courts engaging in policy making. And it also helps us to understand why the statutes deal with this as well. So that's an example of the legislature engaging in policy making to override the court's policy at policy choices. Right? So Okay, what other questions do you guys have about the, um, the uh, about occupiers liability before we move on to today's uh, activity?
Nothing else? Last chance. Okay. So this week we're going to be talking about remoteness. And the task that was posted on the tutorial was to write a fact pattern that fails each step of the remoteness analysis, right? All three steps that Professor Dworkin identifies. The reasonable source of danger, the reasonable manner of harm, and the reasonable type of harm, all right? This is an exercise in boundary drawing. So I don't anticipate, like these are, if you, if you feel like you're coming up with an absurd fact pattern, that's part of the point. Um, but I recognize that a lot of you guys are revising, we're revising for, for CRIM and so you may not have had a chance to do this. So what I would like to do is I would like to start by you guys just taking a few minutes to gather your own thoughts and then we will go into uh, small groups and you will talk amongst yourselves. So here is, here is some time, just a few minutes for you to respond to the tutorial prompt on e-learning and uh, then we'll, we'll reconvene. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's reconvene. You guys have had a few minutes to um, gather your thoughts on the tutorial task. Uh, so now we're going to do the next step of the think pair share. And we're going to go into breakout rooms just so you guys can discuss what you came up with with one another. And remember that the key piece here is to make each other's fact patterns better. So you should ask the question, how does this fail the, uh, this particular piece of the puzzle? Um, and that's going to take a few, uh, and that, that may take a few minutes. So we'll just step into the breakout rooms and uh, take care of that. So there's seven of you guys. So that's gonna be, three rooms and one per, one room will have three people in it. So and please head on in and uh, we'll we'll be back in just a few minutes. Alicia, are you okay? Okay, so here we are, we've reconvened. Let me um, thank you guys who stuck around and um, uh, let me start by apologizing to Ravi, uh, who was the only survivor of the group of three. Um, so uh, Ravi, why don't, 
why don't we uh, hear from you second so that you don't have the mortifying uh, issue of having to go first. When we hear from someone else uh, first. So, and again, remember that the, uh, the goal here is to present your partner's work. So would someone from group two or group three like to go first? Well, sir, in mine and Alessandra's group, we, we were trying to think of a situation. We didn't really get very far though, but what, but we had two, two things. First, she came up with, um, there was a house with an electric fence and mm -hmm. like a lot of security measures, but a particular electric fence. Mm -hmm. um, what I was thinking was, perhaps a nail happened to just be on the outside of the electric fence or a nail or just something metallic along and then someone walking by step on the didn't touch the fence but step on the other metal thing and got electrocuted because of that mm -hmm. um that was i think that that would fail the first part of the reasonable reasonably foreseeable Okay, I, I think I think you're onto something. Explain to me how this isn't a reasonably foreseeable source of danger. Oh, because oh, because also there were signs saying like don't touch the fence. The fence is electric, mm -hmm. right? And because I guess I I wouldn't expect for there to just be like a um, a metal thing right. or a nail or whatever just. Right, we, we expect an electric fence to sort of be a fence. We don't expect it to be a fence and then also random, you know, protuberances right. out beyond the fence, right? So that, that I think is a, a, um, a useful and interesting uh, piece of, of the puzzle. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a helpful piece of the puzzle. So now let's let's move on to the manner of harm. What's how is this not reasonably, I guess for sort of the same reasons, right? That the fence, mm -hmm. you know, we we don't expect fences to extend beyond themselves. Um, where I'm a little concerned is the type of harm. So can you explain to me how the type of harm isn't reasonably foreseeable? under these circumstances? Oh, fair enough. I guess it would be because there's an electrocution mm -hmm. and there's an electric fence. Yep. And they're both, these are both harms to the person, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So in order to add to this, to make this, you know, maybe fit, to, to fit the, the, the call of the assignment, which is to write a fact pattern that fails the remoteness analysis, um, we would have our, you know, our plaintiff um, when they when they step on the nail and electrocute themselves, they uh, fall down a hill, <laughs> right, and um, you know, knock over a uh, a fruit vendor's cart, and what's actually happening is the fruit vendor is suing the owner of the electric fence for the damage to the fruit cart. And so now instead of a, a harm to the person, we have a harm to property. Okay. And so, and we may also, we may even have, you know, at that point, I think the, the manner of harm analysis is even easier, right? Because okay. now, now we have a story that really does sort of look a little daft, right? So... Mm -hmm. But okay. really, a really great like first effort, and not much needed to 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 make it uh, fit within the call of the assignment. So, Lasanta, go ahead. Your your hand is raised. Lasanta, right? The um, uh, hi. Right. Good morning. So the actual fact person. Hi. Good morning. So, what about the in a case? is where I live in an area where there are no children and children have 
haven't lived in this area for like say over 30 years and no child passes in the area. But this seven year old child, and it's possible because somebody that lived near me, the child ran away. And this seven year old child just happened to run away from their parents and they run into my neighborhood. Like, and I have like a eight feet gate around my house and I got like, you know, big dogs that will bite you and eat you. The only food I don't eat is like the family. So what about if no, I got a lot on my gate, right? And they like pick the lot or do something and mash up the lot. Or oh, cannot they get my dog bump on them and eat them? Like, what going on there? Ooh, Sorry. A uh, lot, lot of moving parts here. Um, okay. So the first, I mean, let us assume that we don't have any issues with causation, right? I see some causation issues. I see some but for issues, especially when you say, what if they pick the lock? That Because that, that sure sounds to me like an intervening cause. Um, but uh, let's assume that those, those issues are sort of dealt with. Um, so the first question in the remoteness analysis is, is the instrument of harm a reasonably foreseeable source of danger? So do we think that dogs are reasonably foreseeable sources of danger? What do we think? Sir, yes, but I have a big gate, a big, big gate with a nice fancy lock that this child unlocked. So, sir, yes, but I put like steps in place to like, you know, yeah, avoid nope, harm I, to- you're, uh, you're, you're absolutely right that the fact pattern as you've written it probably avoids liability because there's no breach of duty and there's an intervening cause, right? But we're asking the question about remoteness. And so we want to, and so we're going to assume that those issues go away for some reason so that we can deal with the hypo as it's presented. Um, and one of the, and you know, I keep, I keep uh, coming back to this because you guys keep giving me dog bite hypos. Um, dog bite cases present a particular issue with remoteness where the breed of the dog matters and the history of the individual dog matters, right? So some breeds are just seen as inherently dangerous and those, those breeds are reasonably foreseeable sources of danger. Other breeds are not seen as inherently dangerous, but the individuals might be, right? So you can, you can have a vicious Labrador retriever Okay, even though most of the time the most dangerous thing from a Labrador retriever is that it will lick you to death. Um, but you can have a vicious one, right? You can have one that bites. And um, if you do, if you know that you do, then that dog is a reasonably foreseeable source of danger. So, so the way that you've written the hypo, mm, I'm not sure that we we fail the first step, okay? Because because remember that's the question here is we want to fail the remoteness analysis, and but I think that just a very small tweak where we say look, these are not dogs that you've trained to you know bite people and eat them right. You're not you're, you're not um, you know you're not a James Bond villain. <laughs> um, these are just your pets and you don't have any reason to think that they would engage in that sort of behavior, but they did. And so that is where I think maybe a dog bite case fails the first step of the remoteness analysis. And this is why I say that a lot of dog bite cases turn on, you know, dogs get one free bite, you know, so to speak. Okay. Um, the second step of the analysis, right? So we, we've altered the hypo just a little bit to fail the first step. The second step of the analysis is the manner of harm. And here's where I think, right, so your dog is now a small dog that does not bite, right? Yes. Um, or that has no history of biting. Um, uh, and 
The second step is the manner of harm, right? The daftness. And here's where I think, you know, some of these things like, well, we build a, you know, we built a reasonably high fence and it has a locked gate that the child picked. And like all of these things are where we're going, why does it make sense to hold this defendant liable when all of these things were already in place to protect the plaintiff? Okay, so I think that's a, that, I think you've, you've done a good job of capturing that element of the analysis, okay? And then the third element is the type of harm. And again, you know, this is a situation where, look, dog bites cause harm to the person, right? They don't, the dog who can harm a car by, by catching it, by biting it, hasn't been born, um, you know, but what if we alter the hypo and we say that instead of the dog, you know, jumping out and, and harming this trespasser, this child, what if we say that the dog runs past the child, runs out of the yard, into the road, and a driver swerves to avoid the car and drives into someone's house? And now the homeowner and the driver are suing the dog's owner for harm to their property. Do we think that's a reasonably foreseeable type of harm under these circumstances? Eh, maybe, maybe. I can see an argument for both sides. Okay. So does this make sense? Do we, do we feel like we've got a grip on this? Do we see kind of how, how this was supposed to work? Do you see now why I was talking about this is a, an exercise in boundary drawing? Sir, I, I think I, I have the two, the first two elements, but the, sec, the last one, the type of harm, I don't think that I understand. So this is, this is the issue where we have the headings of damage, right? We have the harm to the person, the harm to property, the economic loss, and we try and analyze what the type of expected loss would be for this type of incident, right? Do we expect that when someone's dog gets loose that they're going to harm people's persons or people's property? Well, Probably we think they're going to harm people's persons because we think the danger of a dog being loose is that the dog is going to bite people. Um, we don't necessarily think that the danger of the dog being loose is that they cause people to, to drive into houses. Okay. And that, you know, maybe that's foreseeable, maybe it's not. Um, so does that, does, does that help? Yes, yeah, sir. I got it. Great. Okay. What other questions do we do we have? So, sir, what if she comes? He, it was a boy. He comes into my gate. He comes into my house. I pee pit the gate, right? And uh -huh. like I had like, this thing dig out to, I don't know, it just a, a thing that dig out to like to four feet. And each other like dropping it and hurt himself or whatever the case is. Like what happens there? Well, it's possible that this isn't, you know, it's possible that this isn't a negligence case. It's possible that this is an occupier's liability case, in which case the negligence analysis is not going to apply. Right? The um the uh in premises liability we don't ask the question about uh 
causation and remoteness, we just ask about that. Okay. So that the the answer to your question is, I think that this is likely to be a um, that that piece of the hires liability analysis rather than under the negligence analysis. Okay. Yes, sir. I understand. Great. Okay. Last chance for questions. No other questions, okay? Going once, going twice. All right, then I'm going to wrap things up. I will see you guys tomorrow, so take care. Bye. Bye, sir.